Good afternoon, everybody. Today we go back to the Green's functions uh, uh, theory formalism, and we will discuss uh, the Bethe-Salpeter equation. The Bethe-Salpeter equation is now gaining popularity in different contexts, from uh, solid state physics to quantum chemistry. It was uh, originally um, derived in the context of nuclear physics, and um, it can be applied to different problems uh, concerning two particle scattering. Um, so in, in different contexts, uh, um, whenever there is uh, um, the problem of describing the scattering of two different particles, and um, it can be used, uh, for instance, to calculate spin excitations in the in relation to the T-matrix approximation, or uh, um, it can be used uh, to uh, study vertex uh, correction beyond the GW approximation. It can be used uh, uh, also to go beyond dynamical mean field theory. And it's also the elementary brick um, at the basis of the parquet theory. Moreover, it can be used uh, since it's uh, in the framework of linear response to calculate total energy or instability of um, uh, systems, of different systems. Here, we will focus on a particular aspect, and it's the use of the beta sulpeter equation to describe absorption spectra, electron hole uh, excitations, and excitons in, in particular. We will be in the in context of linear response. The beta sulpeter equation can be also uh, expressed in beyond linear response. Here, we will just focus on the linear response uh, formalism. Uh, you will see that in the following, I will make a lot of connections with uh, the lectures by Xavier on the GW approximation and the Green's functions, and with the lecture of Francesco about uh, TDFT. I will focus on the concepts, uh, on the physical concepts, on the ideas. The formal derivation will be uh, pretty short and it's not very difficult. I will uh, not uh, um, enter too much in the computational details because you will have uh, next week uh, another lecture by Pierre-Francois on the computational details for the beta cell petri equation in, in quantum chemistry. Um, now, a good thing about online schools is the fact that we can have many more participants than, uh, than the usual. Um, and also I can be, uh, as today, uh, this morning in a school in Rwanda and the same day in a school in, in France. But there are also disadvantages. And uh, the first disadvantage, of course, is that we cannot meet in person. And this is a, a real pity. Uh, and we should also avoid that this online uh, way of uh, uh, lecturing prevent us from uh, interacting. So now this is the 10th or 11th lecture. There is no need for you to be shy. You can unmute your microphone whenever you want, and you can ask questions. This lecture is for you, so please ask questions if you have doubts, if you want to uh, deepen something more in, in details or whatever you want to, to comment. I'm not sure I'm able to answer to your question, but we can, uh, we can discuss. And maybe there, is, uh, there are other people in the audience that can answer the question. To facilitate the interaction, I now suggest you to uh, uh, Exit from the full screen view if you are in the full screen and uh, open your browser and go to uh, this, uh, uh, use this link here, uh, go to this uh, page. So just type www.vuclap.com slash BSE uh, intro. Um, and there you can participate more uh, interactively with, uh, with, with the lecture. Is this okay? So you are uh, connecting now. Very good. Okay, so we can start and we can start with a question. So I would like to know um, if your research work is mainly about molecular systems or extended systems. So in first case, it's about atoms, molecules, finite systems. In the second case, uh, should be something like solids, surfaces, 2D materials at least where uh, one dimension is infinite. So it could be, um, I don't know, 1D, 2D, or a solid a surface. Um, okay. So let's see. There are still some answers missing, but 
molecular systems are winning. So let's say two thirds and one third. Very good. So this works. If you want to still answer, but it's okay. I think it's a good representation of the audience. Very good. Okay, so don't hesitate to interrupt me whenever you want. First of all, I would like to thank uh, several people in, in the group here in, in Palizou. Uh, in particular, uh, Francesco and Lucia from them, I have uh, taken many ideas that you will uh, uh, listen in, in the following. And also uh, I've taken uh, uh, some of the uh, figures that you will see. So many thanks to them. Here you see in a picture of the group in this uh, COVID time, you see still many of, of the members of, of the group still uh, smiling, so that, that's a good sign. And also I would like to thank two former postdocs of the group, Pierluigi Kudaz and uh, Jaco Coschelo, because they've uh, contributed a lot in uh, my personal understanding of exciton physics. I don't know if there will be time to enter uh, in the details about the exciton physics, but if it is the case, you will see that I will mention many times some uh, several uh, key results by, by Pierluigi and also by, by Jaco. So many thanks to all these people. It's always very useful to have good references where you can uh, study more in details. The subject, of course, in two hours, we are not able to cover all the details. I suggest as a first reference, uh, this review by Strinati, um, where uh, that has been already suggested in previous lectures, where you can find a good derivation, a very compact derivation of Edin's equations and the Bethesel-Peter equation. Strinati is a pioneer of the Bethesel-Peter equation in, in solids using a tie bonding formalism. Then uh, uh, the review by Rolfing and Louis is about the first applications of uh, the Bethesel-Peter equations in uh, materials in a, an ab initio context, starting from uh, DFT, CONSHAM, and GW, with applications uh, going from atoms and molecules to infinite systems, to, to solids. So also there you find um, a lot of computational details. Um, Rolfing was already using a Gaussian basis set. So there is also um, some discussion about different basis sets, Gaussian versus plane wave uh, basis sets there. And finally, the third review by Onida, Reining, and Rubio is useful also because it is about the comparison between many body perturbation theory and Green's functions in beta cell Peter and TDFT. Then I suggest these two, two books. The one uh, about uh, um, the, the one by Frieden Beckstead is uh, more uh, mostly about applications in solid state physics. And um, the one by uh, Richard Man Martin, Lucia Reining, and David Seperly uh, is uh, more about uh, the fundamental aspects. And you can find very interesting uh, things in, in both of them. So if you want to study uh, more in detail, these are very good books. OK, so the, um, the plan of the, the lecture is simple. We will start uh, by asking ourselves why we do what we do. It's always very important to find an answer to, to this question. And then we will uh, quickly derive the bethesel peter equation. We will see how to solve it. And we will discuss uh, some uh, prototypical, prototypical results. I have also added the two bonus tracks in case you don't interrupt me and I have to talk for two hours. I hope it's not the case. Um, so this is about uh, the exciton physics and the connection with uh, the TDFT. We will see whether we arrive to, to this point or not. Okay, why we do what we do and what is our goal? So what we would like to discuss and what we would like to do is we would like to um, be able to uh, describe a, an absorption spectrum. Here it's uh, um, uh, represented on, on the left. It, um, you have the absorption spectrum of bulk silicon. It's just an example that we will use in the following. But it's always the case that you have uh, the x-axis where you have the energy axis and the y-axis where you have the absorption spectrum. In the case of extended system, we typically discuss absorption coefficient 
In the case of find the systems, we can have the photo absorption cross section. In both cases, we can uh, relate these uh, quantities to the imaginary part of the dielectric function. So this will be our key quantity that we want to, to simulate using the um, Metzelpeter equation. This is the experimental spectrum, and we are theoreticians. So our task is, of course, to calculate the, the same quantity, and we would like to reproduce the uh, experimental spectrum. This is the uh, necessary condition, but this is not sufficient because if the experiment has already given us a spectrum, if we just uh, are able to reproduce the same spectrum, we don't gain anything. Uh, what we want to do is to understand the experimental uh, uh, features and we want to explain them. We want to understand the physics behind the different peaks, for instance. Moreover, we would like to be able to predict uh, new uh, spectra and would like to be able to guide the realization of new, new experiments. This is why we need something that is based on first principles and it's not based on model approaches. We want to be predictive. Again, just the calculation and uh, being able to re reproduce this experimental spectrum is not enough. We want to go beyond this. And uh, whenever we have uh, a task like this, we have, first of all, to ask ourselves which kind of spectra, which kind of observable we are interested in, and which are the theoretical tools we should use to describe this uh, observable, this spectrum in this case. In our case, again, what we want to do, we want to uh, calculate uh, absorption spectra. In uh, textbooks, what you can find is uh, what is called Fermi's golden rule, where the absorption spectrum and the excitation spectrum, so the imaginary part of the dielectric function, also called ep uh, epsilon two, is given by a sum over independent transitions from valence to conduction states. So from occupied to empty states. And all of them are weighted by an oscillator uh, strength, which, which is in the dipole approximation in the case of uh, optical absorption. So this is giving the intensity of each contribution. And each contribution is located at an energy that is given by the difference between uh, the energy of the balance state, epsilon i, and the energy of the conduction state, uh, state epsilon j. So the spectrum is just the sum of different peaks uh, at the energies of the transition between valence and conduction with an intensity that is given by this matrix element. This matrix element, by the way, can be also zero if selection rules apply. So the result of this uh, calculation, if we use LDA consham ingredients, so LDA energies and LDA orbitals is in the green here. And um, this is again bulk silicon. And you see that the agreement with the experiment is very bad. So the question is, what is wrong? What is missing? And this is a question for you. Do you have any idea? If you have an answer, you can unmute and you can tell the answer to everybody. Okay, you're still shy. Oh, Matteo, someone uh, says in the chat box, uh, correlation. Correlation, okay. What do you mean by correlation? Because correlation is um, a word that has uh, different meanings in different contexts. Okay, I activated my microphone. Uh, well, since we use like LDA approximation, we're missing the non-local part. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is- You mean the, non the fact that the potential, the Konshan potential is local? Yeah. Okay. Then, I can ask uh, this question to everybody and you can answer and you can say whether you, are, you agree with this answer or not. And uh, we can discuss all the answer in a moment. So please answer the question. Now, I don't know your name, the person who answered. Uh, do you find yourself in one of these answers? And if yes, which answer you gave? 
Uh, I gave the second answer, uh, okay. but uh, I'm like divided between the first two ones. Okay. Because so, I also feel that LDA is not good enough. Okay. So if you say that you need a non-local potential, then this means that you need generalized constant energies and orbitals, right? Because constant potential is local by definition. Right? If you follow the lecture by Julien, you should have seen this difference. Yeah. Okay. So if we are in the framework of Consham, we can say that the LDA is not good enough. We need a better functional, but still with the local potential. If we want to go beyond Consham, that's a different story. Okay. Uh, if I, I may, so, sorry, yes, yes. someone wrote also in the chat box that the excited electrons are still bound to the other electrons that remain in the ground state. I just read yes. the, the comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So my favorite answer is number two, because uh, as we have learned uh, in DFT, in principle, it's possible to calculate any observable. Any observable is a functional of the density. The problem is that we don't know this functional. And the consham energies and orbitals are not supposed to give us absorption spectra. Right? The consham orbitals are just supposed to give us the density, the ground state density, but the consham uh, orbitals don't have any other uh, meaning. And also, this applies to the consham energies. And it's not a problem of the LDA itself. Even with the exact functional, we would have the same problem. And uh, it's not uh, by moving to the generalized consham framework that we would solve the problem. Because again, also in the generalized consham framework, in principle, we have an exact functional to get the absorption spectra, but not uh, through the, consham, the generalized consham energies and orbitals. Then there is answer number three. So let's see whether using the GW approximation, we can solve the problem. You have seen in the lecture by uh, Xavier uh, two weeks ago, that uh, we can compare the Consham equation first line with the quasi-particle equation second line. The difference, the main difference between the two is that we replace the exchange correlation potential of Consham by a self-energy that is non-local and frequency dependent in principle. And in the standard perturbative G0 W0 scheme, we can calculate uh, uh, GW corrections just by taking these matrix elements. It is just first order perturbation theory. So we can calculate the quasi-particle energies in the GW, starting from Consham, for instance, from uh, LDA. And we, in this way, we can calculate the, the corrections. If we do so, this is the result. It's the yellow curve. And you see that now the onset, so the uh, beginning of the spectra at low energy is in pretty good agreement with the experiment but still the calculation is far from, from the experiment. The result of a G0 W0 calculation is just a band gap opening. That's why there is a blue shift. We go, we move the onset from low to high energy, but still this is not enough. So again, the question, what is wrong? What is missing? Your opinion now. Someone was already saying something about uh, the fact that in this case, we are exciting an electron uh, from conduction, from valence to conduction, but the electron is still there. Okay, answers are, are uh, coming. Um, is there anyone uh, that is answering uh, one that can comment on this answer, please? Still shy? Okay. <laughs> I see that uh, most of you have understood the trick. Also in this case, I wanted to point to the fact that one particle Green's function is not supposed to give absorption spectra. 
it's not the right quantity that we should calculate. And this implies that uh, uh, GW, which is an approximation to the self-energy to calculate the one particle Green's function, is not what we, we need to calculate the absorption spectrum. Even if we use the exact self-energy and we have the exact one particle Green's function, then we wouldn't have the exact absorption spectrum. So uh, it's true that G0 W0 is not always solving the, the band gap problem of Consham. And not always we have uh, a good uh, description of band gaps because there is a dependency on the starting point. But in the case of silicon, the G0 W0 uh, scheme is, is OK. And um, so this is uh, for uh, answer number one. And for answer number three, I have already commented uh, the fact that even with the exact self-energy, this is not enough. So we need to go, to go beyond the fact that uh, we, for the moment, we just know how to calculate the one particle Green's function. This is not enough. Indeed, what is uh, the one particle Green's function and what is uh, uh, the GW uh, band structure? Again, uh, we have to make a connection with the experiment. After all, this is uh, guiding what are the observables we want to, to calculate. And the one particle Green's function has poles that correspond to addition and removal energies. In the case of direct photoemission, there is an incoming photon and an outgoing electron, and we are measuring removal energies. So we are measuring the uh, occupied states. In the case of inverse photoemission, we are adding one electron to the unoccupied states, and the, we are measuring the energy of the outgoing uh, photon. And this is the addition energies. And these correspond to first approximation uh, if we avoid some complication with the, with the experiment. By, by definition, the additional removal energies corresponds to the poles of the one particle Green's function. And then the GW approximation is an approximation to the self-energy. And the physical uh, problem that we want to describe is indeed what happens when we remove one electron from the system. So when we create a hole inside the electronic system, we want to answer the question, what happens for the presence of this additional positive charge in the case of photoemission uh, in our material, in our electronic system? And the key physical quantity, the key physical process that the GW approximation is taking into account is the fact that the electrons in the system are reacting for the presence of this additional charge in the system. They polarize, they screen this uh, positive charge. And um, then the GW is an approximation. It's not exact. So it's an approximation in the description of these polarization and screening effects. Um, and the approximation is twofold. First of all, we consider that the polarization is made of non-interacting electron hole pairs. So here you see electron hole pairs that are created by the movement, the displacement of the electrons inside the system for the formation of this polarization charge. The first approximation is that we don't take into account the electron hole interaction in these electron hole pairs, and this corresponds to the random phase approximation. The second approximation is that we consider just um, a classical description of the interaction between this uh, polarization charge and this additional charge in the system. We don't consider uh, induced exchange and correlation potentials due to this uh, perturbation for the presence of this additional charge. These are uh, what are called vertex corrections in the jargon of minibody perturbation theory. In the GW approximation, we neglect both of them. But you see that in the GW approximation, this is the kind of physical process that we want to describe, which is not absorption. In absorption, as some of you have already suggested, what we do, we come with the, with the photon, we excite one electron from valence to conduction, we create an electron hole pair, and we have to describe this electron hole pair, and we have to take into account the electron hole interaction what is called an excitonic effect, effect in the uh, jargon of solid state physics. But in general, we have to take into account the interaction between the electron that is excited into an occupied level and the hole that is left behind. And you see that uh, to describe this electron hole pair, we have now uh, the need to, uh, 
to calculate a two-particle goodness function because we have to describe a two-particle excitation. Okay. Is the difference between photomission and absorption spectroscopy clear now to you? If it is not clear, please just tell me. So I hope that I have convinced you that it's very important to well define the observables that we want to calculate in relation to the experiments we want to describe. And in terms of the observable we need, uh, we want to describe, we need different uh, uh, quantities to, to calculate. So if we want to describe absorption spectroscopy, this one particle Green's function that we have uh, studied so far is not enough. Matteo, maybe yes. one question. Yeah. Uh, you said that we do not consider modification of exchange correlation energy. Uh, Potential. Potential, yeah. Could you please uh, elaborate this? This is the part I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is related to the GW approximation. So it's not the subject of this lecture. This was yes. just meant to be a reminder. Um, but we can uh, understand the physics in the following way. Whenever we create a hole inside the system, like in the case of photoemission, we create a perturbation in the material, right? Yes. This perturbation in the material uh, leads to uh, potentials that have to change. Okay. okay. And which are the potentials in the framework of many body perturbation theory? The R3 potential and the self energy. Yes. The R3 potential describes the classical electrostatic interaction. The self energy contains all, all the quantum mechanical exchange correlation effects. Okay. Okay. And in the GW approximation, we just take into account the variation of the R3 potential. We and don't not, take okay. into account the variation of the self energy, so of the exchange correlation effects. But it is also possible somehow to take into account uh, by through vertex corrections. That's yes, this is the physics of the vertex correction. Okay. If you look no. at the um, Edin's equations, the vertex gamma is related to the functional derivative of the self energy with respect to the Green's function. So you see that the physics of the vertex correction is related to the variation of the self energy with respect to the, to the Green's function. So it's related to the variation of the exchange correlation potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, um, this, the vertex, this the good description of the vertex correction is difficult subject. It can be approximated uh, using TDFT and using uh, two point vertex instead of a three point vertex. And if you want, we can discuss this more in details in another occasion, okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, very good. We all agree that foot emission and absorption are different and we need to calculate two particle gains function. So all of you now want to know about the beta cell petri equation. Very good. But you have already seen uh, last week that we can have also TDFT to, we can use TDFT to simulate absorption spectra. Why then we need uh, more than TDFT? Well, in principle, this is true. We can use TDFT. The problem is that especially for solids, for extended systems, we don't have good approximations to describe exciton physics. Here you see the, what happens if you use TDLDA, so the standard approach of TDFT, uh, to calculate the absorption spectrum of bulk silicon. You see you obtain the blue curve, which is closer to the RPA, to the Consham LDA, um, than to the, to the experiment. So TDLDA and the standard approximation of TDFT, unfortunately, are not uh, adequate. And there is, there is still an intense research ongoing on this uh, derivation of better approximation, kernel approximations for uh, TDFT, for absorption spectra in, in solids. Now it's useful to make a comparison between TDFT and many body perturbation theory, because as I just said, in principle, both TDFT and uh, the beta cell petri equation in linear response, both of them can be formulated in linear response, can describe uh, absorption spectra. 
So in principle, we can describe the same physics, but the approaches are different. As we all know, TDFT is based on, on the density. It's the density, which is the key variable. And we express all the observables as functional of the density. In the case of many body perturbation theory, we express the functionals in terms of the Green's functions. And in DFT and TDFT, uh, we move the density around. So we, we make it in evolution of, of the density. And it's important to observe the fact that TDFT, DFT and TDFT are synthetic theory in the sense that they are a many body theory. They still describe in principle exactly a strange correlation effects, many body effects, but of a collective variable, the density. In, in DFT, in Consham, we have Consham electrons, but these are not the real electrons. Instead, in many body perturbation theory, we go back to the concept of the electrons. We introduce effective electrons, effective interactions. So we have effective electrons, effective holes, what we call quasi-particles that move around and interact with different uh, scattering mechanisms, different interaction mechanisms. And um, of course, there is a price to pay. The equations are more complicated, uh, but the derivation of the approximations is easier in the framework of Green's functional the uh, theory because we are closer to the physical processes that are going on in the, in the system. The TDFT equations are uh, simpler to solve, and that's why TDFT is much more efficient than uh, the beta Salpeter equation. But finding good approximations so far has been more, more difficult. Um, to calculate uh, the neutral excitations we are interested in, we need to calculate the response function chi that has been introduced by Francesco last week. In the case of many body perturbation theory, we already know the one particle Green's, uh, Green's function G that we use to calculate electron addition and removal energies. And the approximation that we already know is the GW approximation. Now we will introduce the two particle correlation function L that describes electron hole excitations. And we will see that the beta Salpeter equation, in principle, it's an exact equation to calculate this two particle correlation function L. So in the case there is no interaction between the electron and the hole, the two particle correlation function just describe the independent motion of one electron and one hole. And in the framework of uh, uh, Green's functions theory, you already know that the uh, movement of one additional particle in the system, in the electronic system, is described by a single uh, one particle Green's function. And since the two processes are independent, there is no interaction between uh, the electron and the hole. There is no interaction be between the propagation of the electron and the, uh, mm, there is no correlation between the propagation of the electron the, and the propagation of the hole the uh, two particle correlation function L0 in this independent particle picture is simply given by the product of the, these two Green's functions. The first Green's function is describing the propagation of one particle from 0.3 to 0.1. The second one is describing the propagation of uh, another particle from 0.2 to 0.4. And here I will start to use this notation where the index one stands for space and time. So R1, T1, and in principle also spin. I will not discuss spin uh, explicitly, but in principle also spin can be accounted by this uh, uh, shortened uh, notation, okay? So this is the independent particle correlation function L0. And what we want to calculate is the uh, two particle correlation function L that takes, takes into account uh, also the, um, the fact that the electron hole uh, mm, that are forming the, the electron pair are interacting particles. So we need to take into account excitonic effects. And in general, this is a four point um, quantity because we need to um, describe the correlated motion of two particles, in two additional particles inside the system. The electron that has been excited from the valence, the conduction state, and the all that has left behind. So the beta Salpeter equation will be just the equation that connects this uh, L0 to this L that contains, that describes all the um, interaction effects. It's a Dyson equation 
as the Dyson equation that you have already seen in the framework of Green's function theory, uh, in the connection between the in, uh, independent particle Green's function G naught and the full Green's function G, and also in the framework of TDFT, uh, it's the Dyson equation that connects the independent particle uh, response function chi naught to the full response function chi. So we can make a parallelism again between TDFT and many-body perturbation theory. As I've already said, the key variable in TDFT is the density. In many-body perturbation theory is the Green's function. We are in both cases in linear response. So in the case of TDFT, we just want to calculate the variation of density for an external local potential. And we calculate this response function chi. The quantity that we want to calculate in um, many-body perturbation theory is this correlation function L that is in linear response, just the variation of the Green's function with respect to a non-local external potential. So you see that um, this is a four-point quantity because it's a functional variation of a two-point quantity with respect to another two-point quantity. So it has to be, again, a four-point quantity. Instead, in the case of uh, TDFT, we have two-point quantity because these are one point objects. And then, as I just said, the beta salpeter equation is just a Dyson equation that connects L0 to L in the same way as in TDFT, we have a Dyson equation that connects chi naught to chi. Then the structure of the Dyson equation is always the same. You have um, the part that you are able to calculate plus a correction with the kernel inside an integral term. And this kernel is, of course, different in the two cases. And you see that in the case of beta salpeter equation, this is more complicated. It's a four-point equation. You have four-point integrals here, while, while here you have two-point integrals. But the result will be just the calculation of this response function. Matteo. Now I will uh, derive uh, briefly Excuse me, sorry. the beta salpeter equation. Yeah. Sorry, someone asked in the chat box. Uh, so I just read, what about the particle particle corrections? Do we ignore those for absorption spectra? Uh, these are diagrams that enter in the uh, description of the single particle Green's function, for instance, and also in the interactions. So they are there. If this is what you mean, this is for absorption spectrum. You can also solve a two particle uh, um, correlate for a two particle correlation function. So you can calculate a beta salpeter equation for the particle particle or um, whole whole um, function, two particle Green's function, which is not what we need for absorption. Okay, and uh, the connection between TDFT and many body perturbation theory is clear in the sense that. You have already seen uh, that the diagonal in space and time of the Green's function is the density. And from this, and from the previous definitions, you can understand that the diagonal of this particular diagonal of this quantity L gives us the response function of TDFT. And again, the notation here, one plus, means that we have to add this small eta to the time argument, because we need to, to define the, um, um, the fact that one or the other variable are uh, earlier or after uh, the other. This is, has been already discussed by Xavier. But if you like, at the moment, it's just a, a detail. Um, so an important reminder for the derivation of the beta salpeter equation is the fact that uh, we have already introduced this Dyson equation uh, for the Green's function. Here, I connect the Arte Green's function with the full Green's function. And I have added this external perturbation that is no local. And this external perturbation can be added to the kernel of the Dyson equation. And uh, also to simplify the notation, from now on, I will not use integrals. Um, you will understand that when there are uh, um, variables that are repeated, on one side of the equation, there are integrals there, okay? Otherwise, the equations in many body perturbation theory, especially for the beta salpeter equation, are too long. 
And this is uh, an exercise for you. Maybe you have already done it um, with uh, after the, the lecture by Xavier, but you can easily demonstrate that this first equation uh, is equivalent to the equation for the inverse uh, Green's function that is written here. And this equation, uh, of course, there are some uh, um, some um, constraints on this, but we are not going to into the mathematical details for for this. Um, but okay, in the general case, we can just say that these are these two are equivalent. And this uh, inverse Green's function is useful because it directly connects with the with the potentials. So the inverse Green's function is related to, to the potentials, and we will make use of this in just one uh, moment. I hope this is clear. Okay, so uh, the derivation. This is the quantity that we want to calculate. It's the functional derivative of the single particle Green's function with respect to the external potential. And we want to derive a Dyson equation that connects L0, the independent particle uh, counterpart of uh, this L with respect to the full quantity um, that we want to, to calculate. So what we do, first we use this trick Instead of uh, having the functional derivative of G, we uh, uh, reformulate this, we rewrite this in terms of the functional derivative of G minus one. And also this has been already derived by Xavier. So I assume that uh, you know how to go from, uh, to, to, do, to make this step. If not, just uh, ask. And then we insert uh, the Dyson equation that I have just mentioned. So we insert the relation between G minus one and G R three minus one, the external potential and the self energy. And then we take the functional derivative of what we are able to, to calculate. And um, the functional derivative of the external potential with respect to itself just gives us a delta function, actually two delta functions, delta three, five, delta four, six, let's say that you can then multiply by the two Green's function here, and you have this term here. The uh, functional derivative of G minus one R3 with respect to the external potential at the end is just the functional derivative of the R3 term with respect to the external potential. All the other parts in the R3 Hamiltonian are independent of the external potential. So the functional derivative is zero. And then we have again, uh, still this, uh, functional derivative with respect uh, of the self energy with respect to the um, external potential. We are almost there. What we need just to do, we insert a chain uh, the a functional derivative. So we rewrite this using a chain rule with uh, um, a functional derivative with respect to G. And then we have uh, the functional derivative, derivative of G with respect to the external potential for both terms here. And now we can just recognize the different terms. These are just L0. So the independent particle uh, correlation function. These we can easily calculate. The functional derivative of the R3 potential with respect to the Green's function is just the Coulomb interaction, right? Because the R3 potential is just uh, the integral of the density and the Coulomb potential. So we can calculate the functional derivative of the density with respect to the Green's function easily. Again, we get some delta functions there. And then we still have this difficult uh, uh, term that is the functional derivative of the self energy with respect to the Green's function. And this will be the term that we will have to approximate. And this is again, the quantity we started from. So in this way, we are able to recover this Dyson equation structure that it's very useful because we can uh, explore the fact that we can make simple approximations of the kernel to get advanced, more advanced approximations to the quantity that we want to, to calculate here. It's much better to approximate the kernel of a Dyson equation than approximate it directly the quantity that we want to, to calculate. So we will exploit this fact in, also in the case of the Bethesda Petra equation. This is in principle exact. This is in principle way to calculate the two particle correlation function. So far, everything is exact. 
But the problem is that we are not able to, to calculate, in particular, this functional derivative, and we have to make an approximation to the self energy. And the standard approximation that we will uh, use is uh, the GW approximation. It's a choice. In principle, we can make any approximation to the self energy and derive other approximations to the beta self beta equation. But in 99% of the cases, people what use um, for the, what mean for the beta self beta equation nowadays is the GW approximation to the beta self beta equation. So the GW approximation is the GW, uh, it's an approximation to the self energy. And the approximation is just the fact that the self energy is written as a product of one particle Green's function and the screen Coulomb interaction W. And we have to replace this approximation everywhere in the calculation of the uh, self energy and also in the calculation of the Green's functions that we use to calculate L0. And then we can, with this approximation, we can calculate this functional derivative. Symbolic, the, uh, symbolically, the functional derivative of the product of G and W is just the following, is W plus this other term. And normally uh, we uh, neglect this second term. So we neglect the functional derivative of W with respect to G because physically we can understand that this is of higher order in W. So this would describe the variation of the screen interaction for the perturbation. And this is typically neglected, okay? So uh, at the end, this um, term that we needed to approximate is just replaced by W, okay? This is the result of, of the approximation. We finally obtain this. And um, we make another approximation, a further approximation, which is the fact that we consider a static approximation to the screen interaction. You know that in principle, the screen interaction is frequency dependent. So it depends on the time difference, if you like. It depends on the time that is needed to build this polarization cloud. We neglect this. We make an adiabatic approximation, a static approximation. We consider the screen interaction just at uh, uh, energy C zero. And we think that this interaction is instantaneous. So you see that there is a delta in time. And together with this approximation, we make a quasi-particle approximation to G for the calculation of L0. In principle, we should calculate, we should use the full GW uh, Green's function G. We don't do this. The only thing that we do, we use the GW quasi-particle energies that we have obtained with GW corrections at the place of the Consham eigenvalues. But this is not the GW Green's function G. It's not the Green's function that corresponds to the GW approximation to the self energy to the solution of the Dyson equation in the, for G in the GW approximation, okay? And there are reasons uh, practical reasons to do this. It's because um, a, a beta cell beta equation, a Dyson equation with the frequency dependent uh, kernel is complicated to solve. And there are also um, reasons based on cancellations between these uh, two um, dynamical effects. Um, and this has been demonstrated at the first order in W in this work by Frieden Beckstead and, and others. There are also um, more recent works by Andrea Marini and Rodolfo del Sole. And uh, I would suggest, if you want to know more uh, about this, I would uh, recommend this recent uh, work by uh, Pierluigi Kudaz and Lucia Reining, where they, where they describe these cancellations between dynamical effects more in details and going beyond this first order in, in W. But this is just to, to tell you what is the standard approximation, GW approximation of the beta cell petri equation that we normally use to calculate absorption spectra. So the final result is the following. We have the beta cell petri equation in the GW approximation. That is a Dyson equation connecting L0 that describe in terms of Feynman diagrams, just the propagation of an electron and the hole with this uh, a space and time points. 
plus a correction that is given by the kernel of the Dyson equation. And the kernel of the Dyson equation has two terms, the Coulomb interaction V, by the way, it's the same that you have also in TDFT, and the screen Coulomb interaction W. And now it's important to pay attention to the indices of the delta functions here, because you immediately recognize that these indices are not the same for V and W. And indeed, uh, V, the Coulomb interaction, is a repulsive electron exchange interaction. It's a dipole-dipole type of interaction, while W is an attractive electron direct interaction. It's attractive. It's the one that is responsible for the electron attraction for excitonic effects, while V is responsible for uh, a repulsive interaction. So it's not describing excitonic effects. It's describing something else. And uh, this W is a monopole, monopole type of interaction, the charge char interaction. So it has a different form with respect to V. It's screened, it's a screen Coulomb interaction, while V is the bare Coulomb interaction. Okay, so W is weaker than V in general because it is screened by the dielectric function. W is epsilon minus one uh, times V, right? You remember this definition. Okay, so you see that uh, the physics described by the, the kernel of the beta salpeter equation is twofold. You have a direct interaction that is attractive responsible for excitonic effects and a repulsive interaction that is due to electron exchange interaction. And it is describing dipole-dipole interaction. It is connected to V. Is the difference between V and W electron interactions clear to all of you or not? Do you have questions, comments, doubts, corrections to what I've said? You are still alive? Maybe one clarification. Yeah. Uh, you, you told about uh, GH, the Hartree Green function. Yes. Could you, so is it the, it is not G naught, right? No, it's, uh, the it's defined here it's the resolvent of the artery hamiltonian okay okay so when we do not have the external so you have the artery hamiltonian with the exact density okay this is important and um, gh is uh, um, the resolvent of this hamiltonian so with respect to g naught it also has uh, uh, vh Heart rhythm, okay. Other questions? I hope the physics about uh, electron interactions is clear. Matteo? Yeah? Um, sorry, I just want to, how can we understand that the W is um, attractive and, and repulsive and okay um, because there is a sign minus here okay <laughs> okay just for this okay okay then, uh, i have to say this is in general true but uh, there are also strange cases okay exotic cases but i don't want to enter into these uh, details okay but in general um the sign is, uh, is uh, an attraction here. Other questions? Yes, hello. Uh, I would like to actually ask about uh, the screening of W, about this epsilon. Yes. Like that should be also a frequency dependent quantity in principle. And yes. I guess it has to be approximated in some way. So could you comment on that a little yes. bit? Yes. So we use the GW approximation, right? We said. Yeah. And the GW approximation contains itself the random phase approximation for the calculation of the screening. This is something I mentioned some time ago, but you have seen already this in the lecture of Xavier. So in the GW approximation, W is calculated in the random phase approximation, meaning that epsilon minus one, the screening, is calculated in the random phase approximation. Then, as you say, in principle, uh, this quantity is frequency dependent. 
okay? But in the standard Bethesel-Peter uh, equation implementation, uh, we make this further approximation. We just consider the screening at frequency zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, but it's not very loud. Okay. Can you speak up? Uh, is it better? Or can you just type and then... Uh... Okay, is it better now? Yeah, much better. Okay, so um, could you explain how the, uh, the type of interaction, if it is dipole-dipole or monopole-monopole, how does it translate to the diagram? Is it... Uh... To the... To the to the diagrams yes it's here it's because it's uh, to see that this is dipole dipole or charge charge i will come back to this more in detail in a moment but you already see that the type of interactions is different because these delta functions are located in different ways different points for the two interactions and indeed in terms of Feynman diagrams you see that uh, these uh, delta functions are uh, located uh, here or here for uh, V, and they are located here and here for W. So they are different. And this implies uh, that these are different interactions. To see this in detail, more in details, to understand this better, I will come back in a moment. But so far, okay. we see uh, uh, just from the fact that the delta functions are different, that the two interactions are different. If we just uh, draw the Feynman diagrams corresponding to, to this, okay? Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Then we can move on. And now we want to solve this equation, right? We have an equation, but still that is, sorry, that is approximated but still we don't know how to solve it. Now, this is uh, uh, a connection to the observables, which is important, especially for those of you that uh, study uh, extended systems, solids. In a case of solids, of extended systems, the quantity that is needed to uh, simulate absorption spectra is not chi, it's what is called chi bar because absorption is uh, the response of this with respect to the external potential plus a microscopic uh, induced potential. So we have to calculate a modified response function chi bar, where in the Dyson equation, instead of the Coulomb interaction, we have a modified Coulomb interaction V. And instead uh, we would calculate chi, the full chi for the calculation of yields spectra, okay? Um, in this case, we would use the full chi. In the case of molecular systems, we typically calculate just chi. We don't make the difference between this chi and chi bar. So in principle, we are calculating uh, electron energy loss spectra, not absorption spectra. But uh, fortunately, the two of them are equivalent. Uh, so there is no problem. Of course, we are calculating correctly absorption spectra. This is just a detail that is important for those of you that are calculating extended systems. The difference between V and V bar is just the fact that uh, V bar, the rise is defined in terms of V, but the long range component, so in the free space, the G equals zero component is set to zero. If you want to know, know more about this, uh, this is derived in this reference here and is related to uh, what uh, in the jargon is called local field effects. But okay, this is just a technical detail and we can just uh, forget about this. Just important to, to be aware about this, especially again, if you are interested in, in solids. So in the following, I will have V or V, or v bar independently of what we, we want to calculate. But in principle for solids, we should use this V bar instead of the full Coulomb interaction. Again, uh, this is related to physically to these local field effects. And if you want to know more, these are the, the, the references, the original references, and or you can get uh, back to the review of modern physics by Onida, Reigning, and, and Rubio. So don't be surprised just if you see V bar instead of V. Uh, this is the motivation of this difference. 
So this is what we want to calculate. We want to solve this Dyson equation and calculate L or L bar. Okay, but the structure of the equation is, is the same. It's important to um, note that if the, as we do typically, the um, screen interaction is static, then the kernel is static. The kernel of the Dyson equation of the Peter is static. And the um, two particle correlation function becomes a function of time difference, t minus t prime. So we can uh, take the Fourier transform of this quantity immediately and uh, have everything in terms of frequency, which is very good because at the end we do spectroscopy. So we want to calculate quantities as a function of frequency. And the beta sulfate itself becomes um, an equation with one frequency, which can be understood as an external parameter. In principle, we should solve this equation for each different frequency. And uh, from, from this L or L bar, we can calculate the spectra, okay? But in practice, we don't do this because we should solve this a very complicated equation because it's a four uh, point equation, at least in, in space. What we do, and we actually uh, do something that it's uh, absolutely common in quantum chemistry, we rewrite this in the orbital space. So we just make a basis transformation transformation from space to orbitals. In the solid state uh, physics, this is called the transition space, but we just go in the basis of, of the uh, orbital space. So we write uh, this uh, correlation function in the orbital space. And I will skip all the details. You will find them in the PDF of the of the this lecture. And at the end, what we have to do, we have to solve um, an eigenvalue problem. And in this eigenvalue problem, we have an excitonic Hamiltonian uh, with some matrix elements in this uh, uh, transition space or this uh, orbital space. And here I will just consider um, what is called the Tandankov approximation, but this can be easily generalized, where we just consider a transition from valence to conduction. We don't consider the coupling uh, with anti-resonant transitions from conduction to valence state. But okay, this is just to simplify the discussion here. This can be easily uh, done. Um, so in this Tandankov approximation for um, insulators, so or for uh, systems where there is a um, homolumo gap different from zero, we can write everything in terms of valence and conduction states. And we can take matrix elements with respect to valence and conduction states. And we can express this for this uh, big uh, matrix. Um, this matrix has a diagonal term. And this diagonal term is just given by the uh, energy difference between conduction and valence. And if we neglect this other term, this corresponds to the independent particle approximation. There is no electron hole interaction if we neglect uh, V and W, okay? So instead, um, V and W have off-diagonal elements, and these off-diagonal elements mix the different uh, independent particle transitions to give uh, excitonic effects. And now to answer to the previous question, uh, should be more clear the fact that um, V is a dipole-dipole interaction. And this is due to the fact that um, we have to remember that the valence state is a state where we remove one uh, electron, so it's a positive charge. And uh, conduction is now a, a state where we, where we have moved the electron. So it's a negative charge, but this is dipole. And uh, V is mediating two different dipoles for VC and V prime C prime. So it's a dipole located at R prime and another dipole located at uh, R2. So R1 and R2, sorry. W instead, it's uh, um, an interaction for two uh, hole um, here and two electron here. Okay, so it's a, a positive charge at position R1 and a negative charge at position R2. 
So again, this is a charge ch uh, charge direct interaction. This is a dipole dipole exchange interaction, the one with V. I hope now this is more clear. And as I just said, what we do typically, we solve this uh, eigenvalue problem. There are different uh, te techniques to, to solve uh, eigenvalue problems. The most uh, simple is just diagonalization. If you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, we get the excitonic eigenvalues E lambda and the uh, excitonic uh, eigenvectors A lambda. And from this, we can build the spectrum. And the spectrum now is given by this expression here. And we can compare this with the independent particle uh, picture. In the independent particle picture, we, this is what we uh, started from. We have just a sum over independent transitions from valence to conduction, weighted by the oscillator strength. The effect of the uh, solution of the beta sulfate equation is the mixing of these formally independent transitions from valence to conduction. And this is related to these uh, off-diagonal matrix elements. This is related to electron hole interactions. This produces eigenvectors and um, eigenvalues that are typically different with respect to the uh, independent particle transitions. So the final spectrum is different with respect to the original independent quasi-particle spectrum for two reasons. First of all, because the transitions are mixed, so the intensities of the peaks are different. They are modulated by these eigenvectors. Okay, so you see that now the oscillator strength is in general different with respect to the independent particle one. And we have modified the excitation energies. Instead of simple uh, energy difference between conduction and valence, now we have different energies. Okay, and these are um, the excitonic energies. Okay, so the beta sulfate uh, calculation in general is a three step method. Typically, we start from um, LDA consham, but we can do, of course, we can use different approximations for, for consham. And from this, we get the uh, wave functions. Then the second step, we calculate the GW energies and the screen Coulomb interaction W. And then we combine all these ingredients to build the uh, excitonic matrix, the big, this big matrix. And the solution of this matrix is giving us the excitonic eigenstates, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And from this, uh, you can build the spectra. Is this clear? Do you have questions? Yes, actually, I would have a question about mm -hmm. the uh, GW energies EI. In mm -hmm. principle, they have both real and imaginary parts, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. So what about this imaginary part? Like, how does it actually enter the equations? And does it cause any problems? Because that's something that I see as a big difference, for example, compared to DFT and TDDFT. Yes, this is related to what I was mentioning here. We just consider in the standard uh, beta sulfate uh, equation approximation in GW approximation, the real quasi-particle energies that are obtained as a correction to consham energies. Okay, what you are referring to uh, is related to the fact that uh, the self energy is a dynamical object and it's a complex object in general, mm -hmm. and um, this is neglected at this level. Okay, mm -hmm. and the reasons for this is that this is in part compensated by the fact that we make a static approximation to uh, W. In the full uh, GW Green's function, mm -hmm. the spectral function that is the imaginary part of G has a finite width that corresponds to the imaginary part of the energy, uh, as you say, but there are also satellites, okay? Both mm -hmm. of them are related to the fact that the self energy is frequency dependent. In the standard uh, implementation of, of the beta sulfate equation, we neglect these aspects. We simply replace consham eigenvalues with real quasi-particle energies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. But in principle, like you could actually add there also the imaginary parts, right? And like... in principle, not only the imaginary part. Yeah, and the satellites that you mentioned. We should, in principle, use the full G in mm -hmm. GW, but we don't do it. Um, if you want to know more, I suggest you this reference. Uh, 
um, where it's also discussed that if you do so, you have to take into account diagrams that are neglected here. So everything <laughs> becomes more complicated. I see. And in principle, this is, uh, in, sorry, in practice, this is neglected. Mm -hmm. All of this, all of this. And then I actually have another question regarding the Tam Dankov approximation. Yes. So uh, you get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So can we, for example, say that the eigenvectors are orthogonal? Uh, uh, so the, the um, Tam Dankov approximation, it's an approximation uh, for which um, our Hamiltonian is uh, Hermitian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this is the reason why we can write uh, the resolvent of the Hamiltonian, which is this uh, quantity that we want to calculate in this way. Mm -hmm. um, beyond the Tandankov approximation, this is not true anymore. Okay. And then also, I guess, for the imaginary components, like if you actually add the you, imaginary parts, you would basically break the property that is a Hermitian matrix right yes but i wouldn't suggest you to just add the imaginary parts but you right. can do it because uh, then you would uh, miss this cancellation of dynamical effects you should okay okay add all of them but yes then the um, beta cell peter equation is dynamical and mm -hmm. it's not uh, then it's an emission problem anymore yeah okay thank um, you yes and um, so this also means since that um, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, that the excitonic eigenvalues are real. This also means that in this standard approximation, the exciton has an infinite lifetime, which is of course wrong in general. Yeah. Okay, th thanks a lot. But if you go beyond uh, the Tandankov approximation, you include coupling. In this static uh, approximation, um, generally, you still have uh, eigenvalues that are real. You can have eigenvalues that are, uh, in principle, you can have eigenvalues that are also complex, imaginary, if you have instabilities, which is the typical uh, thing that you can study in quantum chemistry when you look at singlet and triplet instabilities. It's the same, same kind of equation. Um, Matteo? Yeah. Someone uh, wrote a question earlier that, in the chat box that I didn't read, but maybe this is the right time. So, uh, so Mohammed was wondering about the connection between TDDFT, so let's say Casida equation, I guess, and the, and the equation now that you solve. So, so in terms of structure and connections, yes. maybe you can say something about this. Yeah, I will. I will. Thank okay. You. Okay. Any other question? No, then I would like to discuss the fact that there is an important difference between V and W. So interaction in a screen plume interaction. Question. Yeah. I wrote a question in the chat box, but uh, maybe you didn't. Sorry, I'm not reading. I'm not able to do two things at the same time. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> didn't notice. My limitation. Please go ahead. No, I, I wrote something in the chat box about uh, the sign of W and uh, and V because in my work I calculated the both of them. Uh, I think I think WRPA and W exact, and um, WRPA is never negative, but W exact could be negative, and we say that is not a superconductivity. Uh, but still, I didn't understand why it is negative, why it could be negative. The W exact. Okay, it's because epsilon can change uh, sign. And this is typically what happens in a low density regime. Okay. And uh, well, um, I think we can discuss separately this point. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Yeah. But yeah, it's an exotic situation. Typically, that's not the case. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Sorry. But okay, that's a good point because we want indeed to discuss the difference between V and W. Uh, these two electronal interactions appearing in the kernel of the beta cell equation. 
Um, so W, as we just said, is epsilon minus one times V, where epsilon minus one is the inverse dielectric uh, function that describes screening. So if there is no screening, what is W? What W uh, becomes? Maybe Abdullah, you want to answer. Any of you, what is W if there is no screening? It's really the imaginary part of epsilon minus one. If there is no, we said that W is epsilon minus one times v, v, the Coulomb interaction. Exactly. If there is no screening. It, it just becomes the, the bare Coulomb interaction. Exactly, okay. And what happens to GW then? It GW will, without screening? It will be exchange artifoc. Artifoc, exactly. So the beta salpeter equation in the GW approximation without screening just becomes time dependent artifoc. Okay, because the self energy would be just the foc operator. GW becomes artifoc. And beta salpeter equation in the GW ap approximation without screening becomes time dependent artery foc. And here again, you see that there are two Coulomb interactions appearing in the kernel of the equation, but this is not zero. And the reason why the kernel is not zero, it's because these are uh, still a direct interaction and exchange interaction, direct uh, electronal interaction and exchange electronal interaction. Okay. So these delta functions are very important. And uh, physically, we see that uh, a limit of the beta salpeter equation in a situation where there is no screening is just time dependent artery foc. A bit more uh, in detail about um, screening in, in a solid. Um, so here, and in particular static screening, on the left, uh, I plot uh, epsilon of Q, where Q is the wave vector in the solid uh, for uh, omega for frequency zero. So this is what we use to calculate uh, W, the screaming interaction in a solid. This is silver chloride. It's a work by Arnaud, Arnaud Laurent. And you see that epsilon is different from one, meaning that there is some screening inside the material. And the screening uh, is larger for a small momentum transfer for small wave vectors, meaning that at short distance, the screening is important. And uh, it's going to, it becomes smaller and smaller for larger uh, Q. Sorry, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> there is no screening at short distances, so at large uh, Q, and the screening is important at a small, a small Q. I'm just becoming tired, sorry. Uh, but this is something that is very important in, in a solid. And this can be also modeled uh, using model dielectric functions. There is uh, um, an entire literature about this. And in this work, Arnaud has uh, uh, replaced the calculation of the screening in RPA with this analytical function. And the comparison is between the uh, black uh, crosses that are explicitly calculated in RPA and the model with the blue line, this, you see that the two uh, agree very well. And then you can use either the fully the explicit uh, uh, RPA W, and this would give you the black curve in the beta salpeter, or the model um, screening using this analytical function. And this would give you the blue curve, and you see that the two uh, agree pretty well. And now, this is uh, interesting for those of you that are interested in uh, habit functions in the framework of TDFT, uh, especially with uh, local range separation, because this uh, function here, in a way, describes this local range separation that is different at long uh, range and short range. And the difference is given by this behavior here. TDFT with hybrids means that the uh, uh, potential in DFT is non-local. And since the potential is non-local, it uh, contains a part of FOC term. This means that 
Also, uh, TDD, TDDFT with hybrids can be understood as an approximation, as a particular form of the beta sulfate equation, which is not the case for TDFT with a, a standard consham local potential. And now I come to the uh, question that was uh, asked before about the difference between Kazid equation uh, for TVFT and with the Salpeter equation. So I had prepared this question, but we can skip it because some of you have already asked more clarifications about this. So uh, again, in the case of many body perturbation theory, the beta sulfate equation, we have a no local self energy. And since we have a no local self energy, we have a four point Dyson equation. We have a four point Dyson equation because we have a functional derivative of a no local object with respect to another no local object. In the case of Consham DFT, we have a local potential, local Consham potential. And we have a two point Dyson equation because we take into account functional derivative of a local object with respect to another uh, local object, the density. Okay, is this clear? I hope so. If yes, then we can compare also the matrix elements that we calculate in the case of the beta sulfate equation and in the case of TDFT in the Casida uh, equation formalism. You see that in the case of the Casida equation formalism, the matrix elements of the Coulomb interaction and FXE had the same form. And indeed, very often we combine the two. And both of them have the form of this dipole-dipole interaction. You see, they are the same. Here we are considering an adiabatic approximation. This can be generalized to dynamical uh, uh, kernels, but for simplicity, we just consider adiabatic approximations. In the case of the beta sulfate equation, we have the first term that is in common. It's just matrix elements of the bare Coulomb interaction, the same. And then we have a different matrix element that is this uh, matrix element of the screened Coulomb interaction W. And you see that this has a different form. And this is indeed uh, very important. For instance, a drawback of TDFT in the adiabatic approximation is the fact that TDFT in the adiabatic approximation is not able to describe charge transfer excitations. The reason is that if uh, you have a charge transfer uh, excitation, the overlap between the valence and conduction states go to zero, goes to zero, because you have a charge transfer between a valence state that is loca located at a given uh, position and a um, conduction state that is located at a different position. So this goes to zero. And if this potential is not diverging, this, sorry, this kernel is not diverging, this matrix element is going to zero. Instead, in the framework of the beta salpeter equation, even though the valence and the conduction states are located in different places, this is not a problem because the matrix elements have a different form. Here, we need to take into, uh, to take into account the overlap between valence states that can be located in the same place and conduction states that can be located in a different but same place. Okay, so this is very important, a very important difference. Now, TDFT with hybrid functionals, where you have a no local potential to start from, so in a generalized consham uh, framework, are more similar to, uh, to this uh, beta salpeter equation kind of uh, matrix elements. I hope I've answered to your questions. If not, please complain. Is it fine? No complaints? No, it's fine, I guess. Okay. So, uh, so far we have seen how to derive, why we want to calculate the, the solution of the data equation and how to solve it. And now I would like just to discuss some, uh, 
some prototypical results. So the success, success of the Wedesel-Peter equation in the GW approximation, but also I would like to discuss the limitations. After all, we are making crude approximations. It's just a cooking recipe that I have discussed. So of course there are limitations. The first example is bulk silicon. It's this example where we started from. And we had in red, the experimental spectrum. In uh, green, the calculation done use, using uh, Consham LDA. In uh, purple, in GW. And now you see that we are able to get an improved description of the absorption spectrum. And the key feature is the fact that this um, uh, peak that is just a shoulder in the GW approximation where there is no excitonic effects is now enhanced in the calculation uh, of uh, the solution of the beta cell beta equation. This is a typical excitonic effect. Uh, the excitonic effect is moving a spectral shape towards lower energy because it's an attractive interaction. And at the same time, the intensity is uh, going up in the peak again because we are reinforcing a peak connected to this electronol in uh, transition due to this uh, electronol interaction. In the case of silicon, there is uh, no not a very large modification of the onset of the spectrum. So the GW uh, and the beta sulfater um, spectra have very similar onset in the spectrum. That's why we say that these are excitons in the continuum of the electronol transitions. In the case of uh, uh, large uh, gap materials like solid argon, the situation is very different. Um, we have the photoemission gap, the quasi-particle gap that is here, this vertical line. And in the absorption spectrum, in the experimental absorption spectrum, we have peaks inside the gap and we call them bound excitons. And by definition, we say that the binding energy of, this, of each peak, of each exciton uh, uh, excitations, let's say, is uh, given by the difference between the GW gap and the um, excitonic energy that correspond to, to a peak. And um, you see that in this case, there is a modification of the transition energies because we have excitonic energies that are smaller than the smallest possible transition energy in GW that correspond to the uh, gap that we can obtain in GW. It is just the smallest conduction minus valence transition. In this case, we talk about bound excitons that correspond to peak inside the, the gap of the material, of the photomission gap of the material. And in this case, the optical gap that is given by the onset of the spectrum is smaller than the photomission, than the quasi-particle gap. The two quantities are different. The difference between the uh, excitonic peak and the uh, quasi-particle peak, the uh, quasi-particle gap, the photomission gap is called the binding energy. And uh, of course, if you do a calculation where you neglect excitonic effects, so the independent particle RPA or the GW RPA, you are completely off the experiment. So you would get either the green or the purple curve here. You really need to, to include, uh, to describe the electronal interaction. Um, what is important of the beta sulfate equation is that not only you can calculate the spectra, you can reproduce the experimental spectra. As I said at the beginning, it's, it's also important to be able to analyze the results and a particular uh, uh, specific kind of analysis that we can do is the fact that we can plot the electron uh, exciton correlation function that is defined here. And this exciton uh, correlation function is telling us how the uh, hole is correlated to the electron. And it's a two particle wave function. It's a two particle uh, amplitude um, in particular. And um, we can plot it by, for instance, fixing the position of the hole somewhere. Here it's fixed at this uh, purple point. And then we typically plot the charge of the electron that is correlated to the hole, to the given hole here. 
and you can uh, have this kind of, of plots. And in this way, you can see that in, in, the result of excitonic effects in a solid is that the um, uh, electron localizes uh, around the hole. This is the typical effect of the electron interaction in an extended system in a solid. It's a correlation effect that induces a localization in real space of the electronic charge around the hole. This is the excitonic amplitude corresponding to this big peak in the case of excitonic peak in the case of lithium fluoride. This was absorption. We can also uh, calculate the excitonic uh, dispersion. So in a solid, this means that we calculate uh, in elastic ray scattering uh, uh, spectra that can be measured at the synchrotron. Uh, so on the left, you have the experimental result given uh, in this uh, reference. And uh, on the right, it's, it's a calculation. And again, you can use the information that you gain by theory to interpret the, the experiment. In this case, you plot uh, the spectra as a function of momentum transfer. Each uh, uh, point in uh, x-axis is a spectrum as a function of energy, and the color is giving the, the intensity. This is, of course, something that you typically can do for uh, a solid material. Now, um, I just said that uh, GW, uh, this uh, beta sulfate equation in GW is the result of a cooking recipe. Typically, we use G0, W0 on top of LDA, uh, but it's not always the case. Mm, in the recent uh, years, uh, people have studied the effect of uh, self-consistency on the ingredients that are used to calculate uh, the excitonic Hamiltonian. So the energies, the orbitals, the screen Coulomb interaction, uh, they can be calculated going beyond the, the standard recipe. So we don't need to use LDA. We don't need to use RPA uh, LDA to calculate W. Uh, in principle, we could use the beta sulfate to calculate W that is used in the beta sulfate equation itself. So we can do a self-consistent calculation. As far as I know, this has been done just once in lithium fluoride by a PhD, PhD student in, in, in the group, Igor. I don't know of other, other uh, cases, but this is in, in principle possible, but it, uh, not uh, done in the, standard, in the standard calculation. In the case of molecular systems, so final systems like atoms and molecules, the beta sulfate uh, equation in the GW approximation is gaining a lot of uh, popularity in the last uh, years. Uh, this is a very good uh, review by, by Xavier and uh, co-workers, co where you see uh, just a, a review of different results. Typically, in uh, molecular systems, we calculate uh, excita excitation energies, vertical excitation energies, rather than uh, um, spectra because uh, it's more difficult, as far as I know, to, to have uh, good reference uh, experimental spectra uh, we can compare with. So typically, we want to calculate uh, excitation energies, um, and we very often compare them uh, with accurate quantum chemical methods. So there is a lot of study benchmarking the beta sulfate equation in different flavors with respect to, to quantum chemistry. And uh, in particular, uh, different people have studied uh, the effect of different levels of self-consistencies, self-consistency in particular for the, uh, what concern the GW uh, approximation uh, that is used as ingredient to calculate the uh, beta sulfate excitonic Hamiltonian. And in molecular systems, we need to go beyond uh, the Tandankov approximation and we need to solve the full beta sulfate equation, including the coupling between resonant and anti resonant transitions. And as I've just discussed, in the uh, framework of the beta sulfate equation, it's natural to describe charge transfer excitations exactly for the reasons that I have discussed. So this has been explicitly showed uh, by different people. Um, Matteo? Yes. Excuse me. So someone asked, um, uh, was wondering if it's possible to uh, calculate the uh, oscillator strength and so on. But I guess you, it's like in TDDFT, right? When it's yes. Yes. We, you can calculate uh, oscillator strengths 
uh, that are defined here. Well, here, this is the oscillator strength that you obtain from the Bethesda Petri equation. Uh, so you can do this for solids and molecular systems uh, equivalently. Okay, and I, I got, uh, so <laughs> Johannes complains because I didn't read the question properly. So he's asking if the sum rules are, is satisfied, right? That's what you mean, Johannes? His microphone is not working, so. Okay, I will come back to this in a moment. Okay. The answer is no. Okay. Okay, um, here it's an interesting, on the left, it's an interesting discussion. It's the error of uh, the beta salpeter excitation energies for this set of molecules uh, with respect to reference quantum chemical uh, calculations for singlets and triplets with respect to plotted as a function of the uh, GW error with uh, respect to different starting points. And you see that there is a correlation between the beta salpeter error and the GW error, a very good correlation, meaning that most of the error that you obtain for these molecules come, comes from the error in the calculation of the GW uh, excitation energy themselves. So if you would, if you add the exact, let's say GW uh, homo lumo gap, then the error for the singlets at least would be very small. For the triplets, the error is not uh, so very well correlated as in the case of singlets with respect to the GW error. And there is some error given by the beta salpeter equation itself. Also, this has been discussed in literature. And I think already in this uh, review, you find some, some results also for uh, singlet and triplets. And um, these are uh, errors for uh, uh, the beta salpeter case. Um, using uh, eigenvalue self-consistent GW. It's a, a calculation for this uh, uh, streptocyanine chain, so th this molecule here. And you see that uh, the beta salpeter equation that is uh, here in red as a function of the number of carbon atoms in the chain is a very good uh, agreement with respect to the reference quantum chemistry calculation. And it's uh, much better than typical uh, TDFT uh, calculations, typical TDFT results for with different functions in uh, for these uh, um, chains. So so far, uh, so good. The beta salpeter equation seems to be very good, but as I said, uh, there are also limitations. Uh, I can illustrate the first one as a uh, violation of exact constraint. Uh, that is due to the fact that we, have, we are using this uh, cooking recipe. We are combining different ingredients. And the reason for this is that we can do the best that we, we can. So typically, we use uh, G0, W0 energies in the uh, calculation of uh, uh, the ingredients of the beta salpeter equation. And we combine this <clears throat> with the static uh, kernel in the beta salpeter equation. And this uh, gives, uh, in the case of the homogeneous electron gas, a plasmon dispersion that is uh, given by this uh, purple uh, dotted line that is far from the exact constraint that at Q equals zero, we should get the plasmon energy given by the random phase approximation or the adiabatic local density approximation. Okay, this is an exact constraint that is violated by the standard beta salpeter equation. And the reason for this is that we use a dynamical GW uh, approximation to calculate quasi-particle energy. And we use a static W to calculate uh, the excitonic kernel of the beta salpeter equation. Instead, we should use to restore this uh, exact constraint, a, st a static approximation to the GW that is called COSEX approximation. In the case of uh, of the homogeneous electron gas, the Coulomb ball, uh, the co part of the COSEX is uh, not important, but in general case, it is. And if you combine the COSEX approximation, it is a static approximation to GW. And the static uh, W in the beta salpeter equation, we restore this exact constraint. And this is the uh, dotted line here. 
okay? Um, so we get the good agreement, but then the spectra would be probably worse with respect to um, the standard uh, GW approximation uh, in the uh, calculation of, of solids. That's, uh, the, and the reason for this is that GW energies are typically better than COSEX energies in standard semiconductors. So the reasons, the motivation for the standard approximations in the Betisulpeter uh, formalism are driven by the fact that we uh, get better agreement with the experiment. And uh, typically we violate some exact strengths. Another constraint that we violate uh, very often is the uh, sum rule. And also this is related to the approximations that we, we make. And it's related to the fact again, that we um, make uh, these uh, uh, dynamical, um, these static approximations to the dynamical contributions in different ways. And also that we neglect the variation of W with respect to the Green's function. But in order to fulfill the F sum rule in principle, we should sum over uh, an infinite range of energy. And it's never the case. We never calculate an infinite uh, range of energy anyway. So we prefer to have a better result uh, with respect to satisfying exact constraints in general. And um, it's difficult to assess the violation with respect to exact constraints because uh, we often don't have exact results. This is a benchmark result where we have the exact result. We should know, we should, we know that we should get this uh, uh, point here and we don't. Um, in the standard static beta sulfate approximation, uh, the, we miss dynamical effects, as I've uh, said. And here, um, I just want to mention works that uh, uh, discuss corrections uh, to excitation energies and spectra, including dynamical effects. So taking into account the fact that the screen interaction is frequency dependent. This has been discussed already in the pioneer work by Strinati for core levels. It's already discussed in the review by Rothfield and Louis. It has been, it has been applied uh, to metals by Marini and, and Del Sole. And it has been discussed for finite systems more recently uh, in these other uh, uh, works here. So these dynamical effects would give you different excitation energies and different uh, spectra in principle. They give corrections to excitation energies and, and spectra. But not only, since the, the kernel is static, um, the beta sulfate kernel in the standard approximation is static, we cannot have uh, multiple excitations in molecules, double excitations. Or in solids, we cannot have uh, um, double excitations related to DD excitations, typically, or double plus one excitations in uh, elastic stress scattering. This is not possible using the standard static beta sulfate uh, uh, approximation, okay? And this has been discussed in, the, in these works by, for instance, Pina, Romaniello, and, and Davide Sangalli. In this work by Elisa Rebolini and Julian Toulouse, they have used the second order uh, approximation um, to get uh, double uh, excitations. And in this more recent work, they have derived uh, by Valerio Levano, Julian Toulouse, and Peter Schuch, <clears throat> they have derived a completely different uh, framework um, to, to discuss uh, dynamical uh, effects. So if you are interested, I suggest you just to go and, and take these, uh, these references. Finally, I want to mention this uh, last work that is, I would say, the most general one that discusses the fact that if you want to uh, discuss, to describe uh, dynamical effects, including uh, double excitations, satellites, it's better not to use a dozen equation formalism like the one of the beta sulfate equation. It's better to use a cumulant expansion for the two particle Green's function. And in this way, we naturally describe the coupling with bosons. And in this work, they have discussed the fact that if you want to go beyond the static beta sulfate equation, if you want to describe dynamical effects, you have to include further diagrams. So we have to be careful about this. They have derived an exciton self-energy 
And um, so this is, I would say, the most general way to discuss the coupling between excitons and bosons and satellites in, uh, in absorption spectra. OK, finally, I would like to make uh, a comment, a uh, remark, going to the simplest limit, the case of the one electron, uh, one electron system. So we can think about uh, H2 plus or, um, yeah, let's say H2 plus or even hydrogen, but uh, H2 plus is, is uh, good as well. In this case, we have one single electron. It's an independent uh, particle problem. Okay. And um, in the beta salpeter equation, we actually, uh, instead of describing this transition from the occupied level to the empty level, we take a detour. We have to calculate first the removal energies of this electron. Then we have to calculate the additional energy to a second electron. Okay. This is through the, cal the GW calculation. And then we have to take into account the attraction between the electron and the hole. And in the case of one single electron, there should be a perfect can cancellation of these terms, right? Because after all, we just want to describe uh, an, uh, the excitation of one single electron. And we know that is, if there is one single electron, then we can describe this in the independent particle framework. In the case of the beta salpeter equation, instead, we go through this uh, uh, three-step process. We need to describe the removal and the additional energies, and then we have to correct this for the electron attraction, okay? And we have to hope that there are perfect cancellation. This is a detour, right? And this can be problematic. Uh, again, in the case of H2+, when the two uh, hydrons, hydrogen nuclei are very far apart, this can be described in the terms of the uh, atomic limit of the upper dimer with one electron. And the GW approximation that we use in the beta salpeter equation is problematic in this case, is completely failing. And even though in principle, we are just describing the problem of one single electron, okay? So in this GW beta salpeter formalism, we are describing this simple event of the excitation of one independent particle in a complicated way. And this can be problematic, especially in the case of degeneracy or in the, what we would call uh, correlation, static correlation, if you like. So probably we should all think about uh, alternative ways uh, of uh, writing, deriving beta salpeter equation uh, type uh, of equations um, where we avoid this uh, detour and we are able to uh, calculate directly what we want, the excitation of one single particle from valence to conduction. This applies to the one electron limit, but of course this can apply to all the situations where the electrons are localized and they can be described in this uh, one electron limit as well. I think I should stop here. Um, so the answer to this question, what do, what do you prefer to discuss uh, more? Uh, Vanier, Frankel, chart transfer exciton, or uh, TDFT, the connection between TDFT and beta salpeter should be nothing because the time is finished and also I'm finishing myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, but if you are interested, I will put uh, all the material in the... Uh, in the slides and the PDF. So if you then have questions, you can just send me an email and we can discuss if you're still interested, okay? You will find both of them in the following part of the lecture. But I think I should stop here before I run out of my voice. If you have a question, of course, we still have 10 minutes and we can, we can discuss about your question, comments, doubts, uh, again, corrections. For uh, these two topics, I let you go through the, the presentation. You will see that uh, there is a discussion about uh, uh, the physics of Vanier, uh, Frankel, Chara transfer excitons on one side, and the connection between the beta salpeter equation and TDFT formalism on the other side. And with this, I would just 
go to the end and thank you all for your attention and your participation in this lecture. Thank you very much, Matteo. So uh, there, there are two questions. So an easy one and another one that I don't understand, but okay, I'll start with the one I understand. <laughs> Somebody is asking about the computational cost of the beta self beta equation compared to to DDFT, I mean, Cassida equation. Uh -huh. I think Pierre-Francois will discuss this more in detail, right? That's true, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's better that we postpone this to, yeah. to next lecture. It depends <clears throat> how you solve the two equations. This is my answer. Ah, Pierre-Francois said yes, he will, so. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, because uh, in molecular systems, after all, you solve a very similar equation. So you solve either the Cassidy equation or the beta salpeter equation. Uh, the difference is in the ingredients that enter the um, construction of this Hamiltonian. In solids, that's not the case. In solids, maybe I can say something about solids. In solids, uh, for TDFT, we, we solve this Dyson equation instead of this Dyson equation. So even in the solution of the Dyson equation, uh, TDFT is uh, better, is faster, cheaper than uh, beta salpeter. Okay, and there is a, another, so uh, Pierre-Francois was just commenting on that, saying that more or less it's the same if you implement it well. But I guess once it's, it's written in an orbital basis, the structure is more or less the same, right? If maybe yeah, the solution right. of the equation is exactly the same. Okay. You can have different uh, um, costs in the calculation of the um, of the Hamiltonian, of the, the matrix elements, matrix elements be just because in the case, let's say of TDLDA, uh, the kernel is given. You don't, there is zero cost for the calculation of the kernel. In the case of uh, the beta salpeter equation, you need to calculate W. So you pay a cost for this and you need to calculate uh, the GW energies. Then, uh, um, you can simplify all this, so. Okay, thank you. And, and then there was a last question that I don't understand, but I, I will read it. So is it possible to interpret the excitonic contour plot for comparison of the area of electronic correlation in ground and excited states? So I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, no, I question. don't know exactly what you mean, but Either. the answer is no, <laughs> in the sense that uh, this is just, a correlation, a two particle correlation for the electron hole excitation. So this function is telling us where the electron goes if I fix the hole in a given position. That's the, the meaning of this function here. Okay, yeah. That's Maybe it. we can compare this to the independent particle picture of the same quantity. In the independent particle picture, uh, in this sum, we have just one term. The uh, two orbitals are uncorrelated. The exciton amplitude is just given by the product of the two orbitals. So since we are in a solid, these are Bloch wave functions that are delocalized everywhere, meaning that this exciton amplitude is completely delocalized everywhere. The effect of the excitonic interaction is to localize the electron hole pair. But this is uh, in a solid. In, uh, in a molecular system, we start already from orbitals that are localized in, in space. So the effect of the excitonic uh, Hamiltonian is just to redistribute uh, this, uh, this weight. OK, good. So I think we're done. So, so Matteo, thanks again. Really, it was really enlightening. I learned and understood a lot again. <laughs> it's good, it's really nice. Thank you so much. Many and thanks. Ina is you. congratulating you in Italian. So it's good. Oh yeah, many Italians. <laughs>
All right. So uh, yeah, so we will upload the, the video online. I mean, it will be on YouTube as usual and the slides and, uh, and that thing. And I think so. Thank you again, Matteo. Everybody is thanking you on the chat box. So it's thanks raining. to everybody. And I hope to meet you soon. Everybody. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. And bye -bye. Uh, see you next week. Bye bye.